Well, I mean, you're not supposed to be sitting there. No, <laughs> totally confused. How many people have usually sat in those pews you've sat in tonight? You've been in those pews for a while. Anybody? Yeah. I know several of you. Now, the best way to have confusion night is when you come in to preach and everybody's in a different place. I'll be totally... I still have quite a few Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a church down south when I was there uh, one time. Huh? Yes, ma'am. She is bossy, I'm telling you. Turn your mic Is that better? Thank you. Hey, man, I feel a whole lot better now. Now i got to start over, yeah. And uh, they would play tricks on me. They would just move around. I've been there for 30 some years and they would move around on me. It really confused you because you're all, this fellow right here is the amen, you know, and this fellow right here does this and this lady does this. And then they start doing it in different places. And you, what happened? What's going on? I want to begin tonight with a, a short Christmas quiz. See if you can answer this. On December 24th, what was Adam's wife known as? Christmas Eve. What do you call an opinion survey in Alaska? North Pole. When salt and pepper say hi to each other, what are they passing on? Seasoned greetings. All right. So I know, hey, you're good. You're good. What do you call a holy man with no change in his pockets? Yeah. So, yeah. St. Nicholas. And what do Spanish sheep say to each other when they wish each other a Merry Christmas? Feliz de Vinod. Some people really like puns, and they're always telling jokes or puns about things. And one of the reasons they're funny is because words are powerful. Words are very powerful. You can say a word with a certain facial expression, and people will interpret it rather than what it meant. I mean, you can say words that say I love you, but if you say them a different way, it's mocking them. And words are powerful. That's why we have the Word of God. What he wrote, he meant for us to understand. What he wrote, he meant for us to look at it. Because there's a reason, there's a message in those words. And many times the words in the Bible show us the real meaning of that particular word. Like in John 1, he talks the Word became flesh. We know that he's talking about Jesus Christ. We know he's talking about God's Son. We know he's talking about the Incarnation. And the Word became flesh, the babe in a manger. And there's so many important words in the Bible that we need to understand. And so when it comes to the message of Christmas, there's so many words that are so powerful at this particular time. And I believe there's supernatural level of words when it comes to this time of year. And so I want to begin by asking a question. Who was, who was this Jesus? What did he come to do? And why did he come to earth? And what child was this? And all those words, all those questions have biblical answers. We should not only know the biblical answers, we ought to know the address. You know what the address is? Where it's found in the Bible. So that we can share from the Bible, from the Word of God, Listen, if you don't have a Bible and you're telling people about Jesus Christ and you don't have something there that's the Word of God, they don't know if you're taking out of the Word of God or you're just telling words. So we all need need to know the address. And the Christmas story is told all the way from Isaiah and all the minor prophets all through the New Testament in so many different ways. I think in order to understand about who this child was and who Christ was, you've got to go to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. I will will say to you that I'm preaching Christmas messages now to Christmas. And the reason I'm doing that is the only time of year I really get to preach Christmas messages. But they're so true and uh, and they're so real. And there's so many different meanings and so many different ways to describe the Christ child. I do believe that we've got used to it as a church. I do believe that we no longer are awed by the word. We're We're no longer thrilled, excited about the Christmas story. Oh, listen, we're going to have a pageant, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But what does it mean? What does it mean to us? How special is it to us? What does it do to our heart? What does it do to our life? What does it do to our belief? And we better understand that the Word of God is so real, so true, and so powerful that we ought to eat it, so to speak. We ought to know it from our heart. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, look at verse 10 and 11. 
But the angel said to them, he's talking about the shepherds, and I spoke about that a little bit this morning, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all people. Aren't you glad he put the word all? He's talking to the shepherds, but I want to give you a message that you're the first one to get that's a message to all the world, to all people. Today in, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Wow. What important words they were to the shepherds and to us. One of the best ways, I think, to fully understand the identity of Christ and see the impact of this message is to focus on what, when, where, who, why, and how of Christmas. And if you're a journalist, that's what you look at. Those words are what you look at. I do believe when we go to the Word of God, if we take those questions and lay them out, and as we read the Word of God, ask those questions. Literally ask the question, when is this happening? Where is it happening? Who is he talking about? Why is he talking about that? And how is this passage, what is it going to do to me? How is it, what is, I mean, how is it working in my life? How does it work in history? How does it work in Christianity? How does it work in our church? How does it work in our lives today? And that's so important. And so I want to use those words tonight, and let's go through this passage and ask those questions. I think they're powerful questions. Just like there are three words I want to use this morning in the passage of Christmas. Anybody tell me the three words? And shepherd. There are three words tonight that are powerful. And they're going to share with you the same God or same Jesus Christ. The what of Christmas... uh, the angels appeared to the shepherd and, and the shepherds and just out of doing their, they're just out doing their job. And so the shepherds come and the angels come and the first thing they had in mind was to take care of these shepherds was to bring peace to them in the midst of their fear. Do you understand that if you are afraid, you're not going to learn or you're not going to hear what's been said? If I get up here tonight and I scare you to death, you're not going to listen to anything I say. Because fear has overtaken faith. And what the, the, what the angels was doing is I want to erase your fear and I want to place in their faith because I've got a, something to tell you that you really need to know and you don't need to be frightened about it. Listen, God wants us to move from fear to faith. He will transfer all of our fears and, and get in the place of that fear, faith. The reason they did not have to tremble was because the angel announced the what of Christmas. And the what of Christmas is, I bring you good news. Wow. That's the what of Christmas. It's simply saying the reason why I'm here, the reason why I'm telling you the story is I've got good news. And really the word good news, when he says declare, it really means announce. It really has the idea of declare or show. It's where we get our word evangel. It is also where we get the word gospel. I am bringing you the gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. There is nothing in the gospel to an unbeliever who's looking and seeking to be saved, who is convicted by God that they ought to fear. The gospel is good news. I got a ticket to heaven. The gospel is good news. I can change your life. The gospel is good news. I can give you peace through the Holy Spirit of God. What good news that is. Please bear with me tonight. I have been had, <coughs> had this whatever it is. I went to the doctor and he said it was uh, I have asthma real bad. So he said it was asthma, and then he said it was sinus, and then he said it was something else, and then he said, it, "Well, I really think it's either the creeping crug or the fungus among us. I'm not sure which one it is." I Do I? I take these pills. Take these pills. And he puts me on uh, prednisone that hypes me up. Then he puts me on uh, an antibody that messes me up, and then he puts me on cough drops that has stuff in it that hypes you up, and all of them make you eat. Do you know prednisone, prednisone makes you hungry? I mean, if you're on prednisone, you eat the refrigerator. I mean, you open it up, you just, and you can't walk by anything without wanting to bite. I'm serious. So now I'm all hyped up, and then I cough, and I get excited, and I cough, and I do this, and I cough, and when you start coughing, I think Chris was telling me the same thing. You start coughing, you can't quit, can you? Just cough, cough, cough. And my wife says, hush. And then she starts coughing. Sir, ma'am, sir. Go get me some. <laughs> and a cup of coffee. And a sandwich. They're not up here. <laughs> okay. Who said what? 
in the midst of that dark night, in the midst of the world filled with bad news. Is it not wonderful that we have good news? And we can share the what of Christmas, and the what of Christmas is rejoice because the Lord Jesus Christ has come. We're going to give you the gospel. We're going to give you good news. We're going to give you hope in the midst of sadness. We're going to, and by the way, it says with great joy. And in the Greek, the word great means maga. It's a maga joy. It's exceedingly above anything you could ever ask or think. It's the greatest joy you can ever have. And there's no greater joy to know this joy is eternal and it is a joy that you can know Jesus Christ. You can have peace, you can have hope, you can have rest, you can have the assurance of salvation, and you can know that you're going to heaven one day. Amen? When you hope, in a, as a child of God, you hope it is just as if it has already happened or just as it is happening. Hope of the world is I kind of hope so. Hope of the Christian is I know so. I know so. The good news is exceedingly exciting because God is bringing about the solution to the sin problem and he's bringing it to all the people. God's mega message was never intended to just for a group of people. God's mega message was intended for the whole world. That's why the Bible says, the gospel in a nutshell, for God so loved the world. What is the world? The cosmos. What is the cosmos? Is everybody in the world. He didn't just love a few people or a particular class of people, a tribe of people. He loved everybody and he died for everybody. And the water Christmas is a good news, which literally brings joy to the world. And folks, when we sing joy to the world, we ought to be excited about that. I mean, I don't want people singing to church, joy to the world, <clears throat> the Lord has come, let us rejoice. No, we ought to be excited. That's the best I got, folks, don't be sad, I mean. We ought to be excited, man. I love it when the piano player just attacks the piano. I love it when the song director attacks the pulpit. I love it when people in the congregation attacks the pews and everybody's excited about the message of joy. And the, G and the angels gave the shepherds in a dark, dreary night the greatest news, the what of Christmas, I bring you joy that you can have, you can possess. What's the win of Christmas? Verse 11 says, it begins with the word today. The birth of the baby was born that day. Today. We don't have to guess about it. In fact, the timing of the incarnation was impeccable. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Everything came to pass at the exact time. I want to tell you something. The world system was ready. The people were searching at that particular time. The prophecies were all being fulfilled at that particular day. And let me tell you, all the Christmas characters were standing in place. It was at that exact moment. And the angels are saying to the shepherds, today, it happened right now. When? Now. Do you understand that we have that Christmas oh, excuse me, all year long? We have that Christmas when? Every day. And it, oh, I get excited when a person gets saved because for the first time in their life, they experience Christmas as it really is. They experience the Savior. God was in no hurry. <coughs> and when the time was right, he moved into action. The birth of Jesus Christ is hinge, is a hinge which the doors of history swing. In fact, the calendar is, is, goes by the, the birth of Jesus Christ, A.D. and B.C., before Christ came and after Christ came, the whole world the, the hinged on this particular day. Today, Jesus is changing the world. Amen. The Old, prophet, Old Testament prophecy, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. We in the New Testament said, it's happened, it's happened, it's happened. Now we're looking for Him coming again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yeah. And what a day that is to understand that we don't just celebrate a fable. We celebrate a stable. Jesus Christ was born in a stable for you and for me. What about the where of Christmas? The what is the mega message of, of that amazing great news, that gospel news, the when was a specific time in history today. And the where of Christmas is in the town of Be David. And now I'll tell you, that refers to Bethlehem. And when you read or study about Bethlehem, that little village called the David's town, uh, that little village was, was called Grandpa Boaz's town and Father Jesse's town and where David grew up. And David, by the way, in that town of Bethlehem was a shepherd boy when he was young. So he was doing the same thing that these shepherds were doing. What a fulfillment. 
David was doing the shepherd boy, and he's singing psalms and writing songs for the, the children of Israel. And on that very t- place, those, the very hillside, the shepherds were abiding in the field, watching their, fi- uh, their sheep by night. And guess what? Jesus Christ stepped out into a little town called Bethlehem. God lets us know, literally lets us know, that this is where it's going to happen. He lets us know everything about Christmas. He never is off key, and He's never out of time. He's never too quick, and He's never too late. It was no accident that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And this fulfilled 700-year-old prophecy that Micah said in chapter 5, verse 2. And after Jesus was born, Matthew chapter 2 tells us that a group of astrologers came and they wanted to know about Jerusalem. And they wanted to know it came to Jerusalem. And they said, where can we find the bo- the, this king that was born? And they, had, they were following the star. But they didn't have specific directions of where Jesus was born. And so they knew that where he was born, but they just didn't know exactly where. And so Herod, the king of Judah, you know the story, was very disturbed, and he began to threaten but the news that a king was born, and he wanted every child, every boy child, male child, two years and under, to be slaughtered, to be killed. And he, together the chief priest and the teachers uh, of the law came to help Herod kill Jesus Christ. Now this amazes me. The very people who should be shedding the message, sharing the message, the chief priest and the writers of the law, the scribes, were now trying to destroy the message. The biggest problem that the church has today is liberal preachers and liberal teachers and liberal churches. And it's been that way all through history. The church tries, the church, they call it the church, tries to destroy the very message that we have a church for. And they're they're teachers of the message. And where is Jesus supposed to be born? I want you to notice how quickly the answer to his question was. Matthew 2, 5. They didn't have to talk about it. They even didn't have to consult their official document. No, all they needed to do is open the Old Testament. In Bethlehem and Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Pretty pinpointed, isn't it? (laughs) Right there in the Bible, right there in the Word, he said, this is where it's going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And he shares, these religious men knew by their heads about this, but they didn't know by their hearts. They knew almost everything there was to know about Jesus, but they did not know him personally and intimately. What a shame that is. You go to church, you can attend every Christmas pageant. You can attend every service. You can sing every song. You can sing in the choir. You can do all those things. And you know by head everything about the Bible and everything about Jesus. But if you don't know Him by heart, in your heart, you're lost. There's no joy. There's no means to the message itself. Listen, it's quite possible, it's quite possible to be close to Christmas, but still far from the impact that Christmas ought to have on our lives. Boy, if we really knew Christmas in our hearts, it would change us. Can you imagine sitting at a nativity scene and you're the shepherds, pretending to be shepherds and all the people that are in the nativity scene, and a young boy walks up to you the nativity scene and looks down and sees Jesus in the stable. And tears begin to roll down his cheek. You've done it every year. you played your part every year. You're used to everything that's going to be sung and everything that's going to be said. And this little boy just got saved. And he walks up and looks down in the stable and sees Jesus. And he says, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You came to save me. You saved me. And I'm so in love with you. Thank you. And now all the shepherds and all the people in the scene, all the characters are now crying. Because they're seeing right before them the effects of Christmas. Christmas ought to affect us, folks. <coughs> it ought to mean something to us. It ought to mean a lot to us. Wow, what Christmas is all about. But also, the who of Christmas. In chapter 2, verse 11, the next phrase actually reads, He's been born to you, Savior Christ Lord. When Luke penned these particular words, he didn't use any article before any of those titles which means the titles himself are very important. Each of these words are extremely important. Three words I used this morning. Shepherd, shepherd and savior. Now I want you to use those words tonight. 
He said in that, at this point, born to you this day, Savior, Christ, and Lord. Savior, Christ, and Lord. Savior. The word Savior means deliverer. All these years, they've been looking for anointed one. All these years, they've been looking for someone to rescue them. Born tonight is your deliverer, is the King of kings, is the Lord of lords. Born tonight is Jesus Christ. And listen to me, Jesus came to set us free of our sins and deliver us from the dominion of the devil. And the role of the Savior was to literally was spelled out in Joseph, and was spelled by Joseph in Matthew 1.21. You are to give him a name. His name shall be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Someone said that if you really want to know Jesus, get to know him intimately. Get to know him intimately. Trust him as all your Savior. Because we're sinners, we need a Savior. And the title would have, would, would have caused people at that day to be startled. Right before them, in their very area, was the deliverer, was Jesus. They had been looking for some type of majestic person to ride in on a horse. He didn't ride in on a horse. He laid in a stable. <laughs> he became the king. He was the king of kings. I like what Isaiah 43, 3 says. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Folks, to call Jesus Savior acknowledges Him as God. It literally admits guilt before Him. And it also admits that we need forgiveness. When you say Jesus is a Savior and you believe that, you're saying, I need Him. I need Him. The second word is Christ. In the Greek, the word Christ means Messiah. It means the anointed one. And it's used over 500 times in the Word of God. The nations of Israel always looked for a future as they waited eagerly for the anointed one and uh, who would bring them salvation. We hear this expectation from the mouth of John the Baptist. Remember Matt, John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And when Jesus found out about the followers of his, remember he had his followers, and he, this he asked the question, who do you think I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ultimately, ultimately Jesus was the anointed office, the anointed Savior, the anointed sufferer, and he died to substitute for all of our sins. He was Savior, he was Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he was Lord. The amazing title reserved in the Old Testament alone, really. And, and the angel here is declaring that Jesus is Yahweh. He's God of gods. He is, he is the, the great God, the I am that I am. And, and Jesus is not just from God. He is God himself. In fact, Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. He said, there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through all whom all we live. He's the only one. God had not become man. The infinite had become the infant. Wow, what a message. That's so important. The Lord, Jesus is the master, and he is in charge. He's supreme. And as much as I want to, we literally ought to bow before his supremacy. Look what Paul said in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. This gets me every time I read it. Therefore God exalted him to be the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when we sing songs and we sing the Christmas songs over and over again, listen to me, the very verse of Silent Night, the baby did what normal babies did, and yet that little baby changed the world. He changed the world. What about the why of Christmas? Have you ever wondered why we even celebrate Christmas? Because he was holy, because he was human, right from the start. The baby in Bethlehem was born literally to die on the cross. Can you imagine having a little baby, and you were poor, and you have hardly any money at all, you couldn't do anything for your baby, and the only reason why your baby was born was to die to, for every person that hated your baby. Can you imagine? And let me ask you something. Your baby died for everybody, and yet you hear them curse your baby. Your baby died for everybody because you loved everybody, and yet they spat on him, and yet they made fun of him, and they mocked him, and they did everything they could. They cursed him, and yet your baby, your baby boy, did it because he loved people 
And everyone, no matter what they did, no matter what they said, no matter what they were doing, he loved them enough to die for them. Can you imagine your son? And what would you think of the people that was doing that to your son? You know what God thought? God so loved the world. Wow. Wow. As important as everything is that I've said so far, Christmas must become a personal confession for it to make a difference in our world and in our life. Notice the two, two words that's stuck in the middle of this. Verse 11. To you. To you. The shepherds did, did nothing to deserve the privilege of hearing this message. They were just out doing their jobs. But the grace that God announced to the world was anew that God could change their life. A Savior has been born. And don't ever leave these words out. To you. To, this is not a message for everybody out there that, that it, listen, it hits right home. When it says to you, if you're reading that, it's to you. It's to you. If everybody in the world rejected Jesus, God would have still died, still came, still died, and still loved you. To you. Well, I can't get over that. A Savior has been born to you. And when you hear this, verse 16 says that they hurried off and found the baby. The proclamation literally from the angels went to their ears, to their hearts. They personified it, and then with their feet they responded to it. Friend, the Savior can never save you until you cry out, Christ came for me. He's my substitute. Until you accept it and you believe it and you cry out to Him, it will never make a difference in your life. What about the how of Christmas? Let's look at that how of Christmas. After one angel appeared to the shepherds, then suddenly an entire army of angels began to sing and saying, glory to God in the highest. And, and they couldn't help but break out in praise because the Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, had been born. Their praise then led them to declare the message of peace. And look, notice what they said. <coughs> and on earth peace to men on which his favor rests. It all starts with the Heavenly Father, God's perfect plan. And, 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 and it arrives on earth with peace. To, and those who, who needed peace the most, it's a personalized message. To you, He came to give peace and rest. Have you ever been tired from stress? Have you ever been tired from worry? Have you ever been tired from discouragement? and doubt, and struggles? Have you ever been tired from your spiritual walk? And don't tell me you've never been tired. If you're serving the Lord, you get tired. But Jesus says, through God, He said, the angel said, I came to give you peace, but also I'm going to favor you with rest. In the Old Testament, peace is the word for salam. It is... Uh, it's a state of holiness. It's a state of harmony that intends to, reson to resonate in a person's life, in relationships. And it literally, it's interesting. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26, Moses said these words, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. And the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Now, in the New Testament, there are three really phases. There are three really planes or a peace. First of all, there's a peace with God. That's the vertical dimension. That's when you look up to God. That's when you, He comes down to you. It's a peace that He gives you, first of all. You can never have any type of peace unless you have that vertical peace. And it's called peace with God. And there's a peace of God that's internally. And that takes place once you, have, when you cry out to God and He comes into your life, you have the inner peace. Inner peace drives out all other uh, crazy things in your life. The stress and the worry and all those other things because the peace of God fills you. He fills you with that peace. And then peace with others. We have peace with God and we experience the peace of God. We'll then begin to extend horizontally the peace of God to other people's life. Look first of all the peace with God. Before we can understand this first dimension of peace, we must come to grips with the state of our relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ. 
if we don't know Jesus Christ, if we don't realize how much he, lo we lo he loves us, if we don't cherish Him, and we don't believe He cherishes us, and we never come to Him personally and intimately, here's what Romans says that's going to happen. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I either receive the truth or I suppress the truth. I either take in the truth or I suppress the truth. And God's wrath pour, is poured out upon those who suppress truth. What is truth? Peace. God wants to give peace. But listen, you've got to get it His way. And what happens many times is we suppress God's peace. We don't accept it. We want to do it our way. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 gives us good news. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we can have peace with God. This word means to set at one again. And really what it literally means is when we get peace of God, He comes and sets beside us. He comes and sets in us. And anything that disrupts the peace has got to go through Him. It's got to be filtered through Him. You know Satan can do nothing to us unless God gives him permission. He can't take your peace unless God gives him permission. And the only time God gives permission if, if He wants to test us so that we know where we are. Testing is not for God to find out where we are. Testing is for us to find out where we are. Or the devil wants to try us. And you hear me say this many times. The difference between testing and trying, or temptation, testing, it, you always know it's testing because it draws you to God. You always know it's tempting because it drives you away from God. So if you're going through something that's driving you away from God, that's not of God, it's of Satan. If you're going through something and it's always drawing you to God, that's of God. Satan will never want to draw you to God, and God will never want to draw you to Satan. So understand that when you're going through something. It is in Colossians 1 20 says that Jesus reconciled himself to all things, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Not only does the cradle bring peace, but the cross brings peace. Isn't that amazing? Listen carefully. We don't deserve this peace. We don't deserve it. Peace to men, we don't deserve the favor that God wants us to give us. In fact, what we deserve is death. What we deserve is hell. But God wants to give us peace. So we have peace with God. Secondly, you have peace of God. In order to have the peace of God internally, we've got to first experience the peace with God vertically. The upward dimension must take, be taken care of before the inward dimension is taken care of. Those at peace with God can experience the peace of God. Understand that. Shortly before Jesus died, it's interesting, he said in John 14, 27, I love this verse. Peace I give, leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The inner peace that Jesus Christ gives to us is a gift from God, and it comes through the key elements of the fruit of the Spirit. It's part of those nine attitudes, nine phases of that peace. We will experience the peace in proportion to the room we give the Holy Spirit to give it to us. I have as much peace with God as I make room for. Now that's a statement. If my inner being is filled with junk, I won't let peace in. I have as much of God as I want. But if I'm so concerned with things of this world, I'm not being able to get the things of God. God will not force His way or will in us. We must ask Him to do that. And there's a peace with others. Peace with God enables us to have peace of God. And Christ the Savior brings peace with God and Christ the Lord brings the peace of God. Another way to say it is that we can't have the peace of God until we know the peace with God. Uh, listen, Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. I think it's interesting. Jesus didn't say or tell us the peacekeepers. But instead he calls the peacemakers. Really, it's, if you translate that word, it's the peace workers. And the whole idea is we're as children of God, we're to constantly fight conflict. We ought to be bringing peace, working for peace in all conflicts. The more we're working for peace, 
the greater peace we'll have, the greater peace other people have, the greater relationship we'll have with God. Listen, the greatest thing I can do when something comes between me and anybody is get it out. God has called me to be a peacekeeper. And the longer I bring something in, allow something in, I begin to lose my peace. And when you start losing your peace, it not only affects you, it affects your marital relationship, it affects your relationship with people, it affects your prayer life, it affects your church life, it affects your attitude, your actions, it affects everything. People know when you have peace, they can see it in your eyes. Romans 14, 19 lays out our responsibility. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. The only way to have peace with God is to have peace inside, and to be at peace with others is to be personalized with the Christmas story, the story of peace. Acts 10, 36 says, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, tell them the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Let's kind of summarize. The what of Christmas is the good news of great joy for all people. And the what when of Christmas is today. And the where of Christmas is in the town of Bethlehem. And the who of Christmas is the Savior, the, the Christ, and the Lord. And the why of Christmas is to you. See, he did this for us. The why he did all these things is for you, sitting right there. If you know who me is or us is, look in the mirror. That's what he's talking about. And the how of Christmas is glory to God and peace to men. Is your Savior Christ? Do you know Christ? Is he your Lord? The baby was born the Son of God, and he came to change the world, and he changes your world. See, it's not going to be important to you if, the, if Jesus changes the world if you don't let him change your world. You can't work in a changed world if you're not changed. Because you'll con- have conflict. You won't be able to associate with the real peace and the real changed world because you have your world war going on in your heart and in your life. Instead of trying to figure out a pun, literally what we need is put our faith in the Son, the Son of God. Someday God will give us an exam. And I believe this is the question he's going to ask us, every one of us. What have you done with Jesus? Christmas is the gift to us, and the name of that gift is Jesus. The second coming is the question of, I gave him to you. What what did you do with him? What did you do with him? What did you do with him? I don't know about you, but I want to be able to say to Jesus, I served you. I love you. Oh, I sang praises to you. I told people about you. You changed my life. I'm forever indebted to you. Wow. And wouldn't it be great to hear him say, well, Tim, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on home. Come on home. Every time a dear friend of Pam and I who loves the Lord, a relative who loved the Lord and served the Lord, dies, we think of the fact, boy, they sure cheated us out of something. They're getting to see something we haven't got to see yet. Sometimes I'm a little jealous. I mean, they're in heaven. Everybody tells me, he said, I just, boy, I wish we were back in the, the, the good old days. Hey, if you were back there, they weren't so good. We have air conditioners. Back there, they didn't. I remember riding around a car, no air conditioners, in Nashville, Tennessee, going to Bible college with her children, Pam. She was pregnant one time. Well, really, three times. But she's pregnant one time, and it's hot. Oh, I'm telling you, you drive, we'd roll down the windows. All you did was inherit heat, you know? Uh, you know, it was, it was hot with the windows down, it was hot with the windows up. And uh, we, but you know, we got used to that. I, I remember, again, you've heard me say before, I can remember the old bathtub, the old tub yes. that we got and took a bath, you know. I still can't figure out how mom had nine of us take a bath in the same tub. <laughs> I still tell people, I'm the middle child, and I, what, what got to me, I just walked across, on, across, right, walked across the scum and sat down on it and took my bath and then walked out. You know, all you did was exchange scum is all you did, you know. And, and, you know, we didn't have deodorant back there. How many, when you were real young, did you have deodorant? Not many of us. Oh, you did? Thank God. <laughs> I hope you're still using it. 
you know. Uh, but we didn't have that. And we only took a bath once a week. But I figured it out. We all smelt the same. So it didn't matter. We just thought that's what human life was. They just, you know, everybody stunk like that. Of course, it was good to live on a farm. And it's pretty good when the, when the corral and the barn and the, uh, the pasture and all that was like from here to that wall from where we slept. I mean, hello. But you know what? Ever since I was a child, there's one thing I knew. Jesus loved me. He loved me. And he came for me. And he died for me. And he's coming back again for me. Pardon my French. Pardon my Greek. But ain't that good? Ain't that good? You know, the world's full of pain. I'll tell you what, there's a man in the church, you know, this morning he showed me. I said, what'd you do to your hand? He said, let me show you. He takes this picture out. And there's a nail that goes right through his hand. Sticks out the other side. He's holding it like this. I said, you try to pull it out? He said, yeah, I tried, but it hurt too much. He had to take him to the hospital, pull it out. Phil, didn't he? Yeah. And uh, I don't like him anymore, but he was, show me that nail. But I had a man in the church who was a carpenter. And you know those hammer, you know the power, air, power tools? He drove a 16-penny nail. He went right through here, right off the other side, squished his leg together, we took him to the hospital around 8 o'clock in the morning, and he stayed in the hallway till 6 o'clock that night before the doctor saw him. And it hurt, didn't it? Every once in a while, they come back and give him a shot. About three hours into it, I said, give me one. I want one of those two. But, you know, and that had a lot of pain, physical pain. But there is also spiritual pain. And Jesus Christ came on Christmas to touch both of them. To touch both of them. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad Jesus came on Christmas? And aren't you glad he's coming again? Amen. Let me tell you what to do. Please do it. Go with God as he goes with you. God bless you. You're dismissed.